Over the past couple of months, as most of us were enjoying the summer break, I took off from the best assignment imaginable to find the real Australia, its character and its characters. Asking, like those at the Constitutional Convention, who are we? What do we want? During the next few weeks, I'll take you on that remarkable journey of discovery through the Australian heartland. We'll cross the tropical top end and journey through the arid centre, setting out tonight from the south, travelling north. This is a journey that will skirt the great cities of Australia. It's a tale of the open road and the wide horizon. A pursuit of the perhaps fanciful notion that some essence of who we are as a nation might still be extracted from the bush, that one-time heartland of the Australian character. So we will never visit a town bigger than Ballarat in Victoria, and this only as a pilgrimage back to a defining moment in Australian history. So and I would imagine that most people are surprised by the size of the thing. Certainly. But the flag, you must remember, was made in 1854 to be flown at a, at a protest meeting in the centre of Ballarat on a huge um, trunk that was 80 feet high. While many Australians have been agonising over an appropriate new national flag, at the Ballarat Fine Art Gallery, historian Anne Begg Sunter believes that we've had one for almost a century and a half. It's one of the great Australian relics, isn't it? It is. It is. It is the, the great Australian relic because it, it, it is the basis of our, our nationalism, I think. After a short, bloody battle in which 120 diggers died, their flag was desecrated by the troopers. Even in this century, the indignities continued. Well, there was a curator here for about 40 years who really loved the flag, and if anybody came in and was interested in the flag, he would say, oh, would you like a little piece? <laughs> and he would cut off, and we can see those little pieces Actually. that are cut off the flag. Australia's mainland state boundaries owe little to nature. All of them bar one are arbitrary lines drawn on a map by bureaucrats and politicians. The exception is our greatest river, the Murray, dividing Victoria from New South Wales. We've got the best sunsets in the world on the Murray River. It's romantic, it's absolutely beautiful. The environmental problems of the Murray are legion, but in the golden afternoon light, gliding through a remnant forest of Murray River red gum, with a couple of dedicated rivermen, you could easily imagine that all was well. These spots are beautiful. They are treasure. They are the future. You know, they're very important for you know, a younger generation coming through, my children. Doug Nichols, the grandson of the famous pastor Doug Nichols, is a member of the Wati Wati tribe who've been here for 5,000 years. His mate Bill Hogg is a fourth generation river skipper. Together, they are campaigning to clean up the Murray. Knock down the boundaries, let the states get about their bickering on political sides of who owns the water and what happens. Let's get on the job. If we've neglected our greatest river, it's a happier story on our highest mountain. How big is this park? It is the size of Belgium. That's very impressive to the Belgians, but it doesn't mean a lot to me. How big okay, is it? Okay, one and a third million acres. Up Kosciuszko Way with mountain guide Jimmy James, an Englishman who was adopted by the mountain 25 years ago. Well, there are places out there that maybe no white man, at least, has ever been. I think that's probably the case. Certainly out towards Victoria, I think there's probably places there that maybe no white person has ever set foot on. Yeah. Yes. Nice feeling, that. Nice thought. It is. To know that, you know, you could be the first person. In Australia, its sheer distance that daunts a traveller, the scale is formidable. What looks like a mere inch on the map turns into a whole day's drive. 
Still, on our ancient, eroded continent, it's rarely an uphill journey. Flatlands and big skies will be our familiar companions for most of this long passage. Wheat country, Narrabri in northern New South Wales, land of the endless paddock, where a farmer like Ray Prominence can seem to own the whole world to the horizon. Ray came here in the 60s with 500 quid. Now he's worth millions and owns 23,000 acres. It's a fair whack of the straight. There's a piece of it, yeah, a piece of it, yeah, that's right. Is, yeah. it, is it possible for a young bloke today to start with nothing, or with 500 quid, and build, yeah. a, build an empire like this? No, you have to have the wind with you. <laughs> <laughs> Out here, there's generally miles between words, and even in a bumpy year like this one, Ray's unlikely to become effusive, nor to recommend the farming life to a mere romantic. Do you reckon I could make a go of it out here? You give it a go, yeah. So you find hard, though. You find life hard. Not easy. Not easy. Not easy. That'd be hard. I think my life's a bit easier, do you? Yes, your life. Your life's easier. Sure is. <laughs> you, you've observed my work practices. <laughs> your work practice is a lot easier too. Is it? <laughs> yeah. From the grain country, I veered eastwards, back into the hills, through the rolling, tree-studded parklands of New England. I'd heard of a sheep farmer up here who was working on a problem we'd encountered way back down the Murray. How do you regard each of them as an individual? Oh, little specks of life. <laughs> From these little specks of life, mighty Murray cod grow. They are such a lovely fish. They are magnificent in their own right. They very strong fish. Scientists warn that the Murray Cod appeared doomed. But here in his high country sheep property, Ray Mepham, a keen amateur, has been breeding them in their millions. And who knows, Ray's babies could one day work their way back down into the Murray River. Because you're a bit of a quiet achiever, aren't you? <laughs> I don't like to boast these things, but uh, we're proud of it. That's how you should We're be. We're proud of handling cod. So you should be. You know, I really thought that I might never see another cod like that. Well, I'm glad you called, uh, Charlie, because uh, there's a lot going on in the bush that's overlooked. I'd never heard of Arcadia, a hidden valley deep in southern Queensland's Great Divide. It was named by the explorer Leichhardt, who first winched his wagons down a 300-metre escarpment back in 1846. As the name suggests, the Arcadia Valley is a rustic paradise. It's also cattle country. I always thought that I would just do what every other woman does and get married and have kids. Um, but it just didn't unfold that way, really. Bloss Hickson farms 14,000 acres of the valley. She came by this property in an unusual way. Ten years ago, she was working in a restaurant in Sydney's Whale Beach. When she learned she'd won the lottery, the prize, a million dollar cattle property. I went down to the beach and I'm walking up and down the beach and this fellow comes along who lives up the road and tells me that he's moving out of well beach and could I look after his cat and I said I've just won a million dollar property in Queensland stuff your cat <laughs> as an old wheat farmer once told me you need the wind with you but hard work is the other essential Bloss has run this place single-handed she's locally renowned for being able to do any job a man can do how come a gem like you is out here alone on this big horizon? Who knows? I can't understand that myself. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just too capable for men. I don't know. I don't know. Would it further deter the local bachelors to know that Bloss is also an artist and a songwriter? I wrote a song for uh, James Blundell, which actually launched him into his singing oh, career. Oh, no. <laughs> You're not going to be good at that, too. 
along a sandy watershed line with noble gum. I, I don't think a lot of people in the coast realise how fabulous the life it is in the country. It's such a fabulous existence that they put up with all the downers just to live here. Across the divide and down onto the coastal plains, through sugarcane country to the Pacific Ocean and a windy coastal town called Bowen. Is it always this windy? Yeah, yeah, blowing Bowen they call it. Oh, so blowing Bowen. Blowing Bowen, yeah. Sometimes it's too easy to be romantic about the Australian back blocks. Bowen might look like a tropical paradise, but Mike Brunker, a recently retrenched coal miner, tells it differently. We've had coal mines closed, we've had uh, power stations closed, railway workers displaced, and now to um, the cream of the cake is our meat works, so yeah, we're doing a bit tough up here. Mike Brunker, aged 32, is also the mayor of Bowen, you, a town yeah. with a 48% unemployment rate. There's often a sense of neglect across regional Australia, a feeling that Canberra doesn't care. We only need a hand, we don't need a hand out, um, just to kick us along a bit. You, d you don't want a hand out? No, we don't. Well, I hope you're able to do something with this town. Yeah, well, who knows, in six years' time or three years' time, if I... Um, if I'm still around, it will um, we'll be a, a good time to see what's happened and see if we have made any improvements. And if we haven't, well, we'll just have to go to Plan B, I suppose. What's Plan B? <laughs> You're going to ask for Plan B. <laughs> I left Bowen in the youthful and capable hands of Mayor Mike Brunker, for I had a legendary Australian destination to achieve. A geographical punctuation mark that would conclude the first three and a half thousand kilometre leg of my quest. This is the tip of Cape York. On the Australian continent, I'd gone as far as I could go. Spiritually, you just become aware of things. Like I, I look at the beauty every day. I can come down to this beach every morning with Margaret and we just look. It's just magnificent. So, are you the luckiest couple in Australia? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's nice to meet happy people. <laughs> yeah. I like to think of time. Margaret Waimara and Alan Gary as our northernmost couple. They run Australia's most remote tourist business, a resort on the very tip of Cape York. He's from the big smoke down south, and she's from the local Ingenue people. And they are in love. How did you meet? Um, Margaret, uh, Margaret's brother used to work here and she applied for a job and when she came it was like, hmm. <laughs> was, it, was it like that for you too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you optimistic for the world, the Australia that your children, when you have them, will grow up into? I think we're a fair-minded race of people. I mean, if you look at the diversity of, of races in Australia, and, I mean, we have no trouble compared to, I mean, I've travelled around you know, Europe and. Australia just doesn't have that temperament, I don't think. Uh, I don't know, people just have to change their attitudes. Weeks of travel and a whole continent still lay ahead. From here I would travel west, following the sun across the top end of Australia, a trip taking me more than 3,000 kilometres to the Indian Ocean. But for now, this was a nice place to gather breath in the company of this capable young couple who managed to make race, something most of us consider our major national problem, not much of a problem at all. I mean, this is real reconciliation of the races in Australia, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I suppose you could look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. Are you reconciled to this bloke? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.